I mean, Melbourne really did guide her and steer her. In those first three or four years, it was an absolutely critical um, period in her development as a monarch and a woman also in terms of her, her intellectual comprehension of the task. But, you know, in terms of her staying, having power and staying in power, ultimately she was only there by the will of the people. And what is so interesting with um, uh, Victoria and Albert is, first of all, they got very panic stricken in 1848 when there was that terrible year of revolutions across Europe. And they worried that it was going to spread to Britain and their throne was going to go because they'd had the rise of the Chartist movement, which was the demand for a greater enfranchisement of people. The trade union movements were growing. Workers and people generally were beginning to find their political voice. So Victoria and Albert were canny enough to understand that they had to stick to the rules of constitutional monarchy. But what is really interesting after his death is when she went in that period of extreme retreat, of obsessive, interminable grieving for Albert for best part of 14, 15 years, there was a serious um, rise in republicanism in Britain. And by 1870, you know, there was challenges being made in Parliament. People were saying, because there she was in retreat, if she wasn't 600 miles away at Balmoral, she was on the Isle of Wight at Osborne. And people were saying, well, why? She's not doing the job. If she's not going to do the job, she should abdicate. And there would have been, I think, growing calls for her to step down and hand the throne over to her son, Bertie, the Prince of Wales. And the person who saved her was a Jew. It was Benjamin Disraeli. Because the uh, Benjamin Disraeli coaxed her back out into public. And, and, and he was the other big, big formative influence in terms of political, uh, politically and in terms of how to be a monarch. He guided her, she took his advice. And she, she again was grief stricken when he died.